Well, I really just want to take about 25 minutes or so and just kind of ask you some questions if that's good. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So there's, there's this incredible verse somebody brought to my attention the other day. It's in Isaiah 46 and it says, um, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it and I will carry you and I will bear you and I will deliver you. And <laughs> it, it moved my heart to think of how long you have served the Lord faithfully. And as a young minister, I'm interested in any keys, any points that you would give to my generation and staying faithful to God. Well, my goodness, that's, uh, you know, that's something I've, I won't say specialized in, but something that's been a, a real burden, you know, on my heart for years is the, the longevity. You know, uh, I have a statement here. I've got some of my old notes here. John Maxwell made this. He says only one out of every 10 men going into the ministry or, or persons, he said, going into the ministry today will be there at the age of 65. So that's a 90% failure rate, you know. And then another statistic here from uh, James Dobson, and this goes back to a newsletter he sent out in 1998, where he, he said, we estimate approximately 1,500 pastors leave their assignment each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention within the local congregation. So that, uh, you know, 1,500 a month translates to 18,000 a year. Men, women in some cases that have had some sort of call, hopefully, some sort of Bible school, Bible college, seminary, uh, some sort of a flock, and uh, 18,000 leaving the ministry every year. Moral failure, number one reason, you know. So, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy. I've had friends that I've uh, worked with that have uh, succumbed to different things, and, uh, you know, your heart grieves because you think that's uh, obviously not God's intention, you know. So, yeah. So what would you say would be a couple of things off the top of your head that will help someone stay faithful to the Lord? You know, I think the first thing is uh, maintaining a devotional life with God. You know, I worked with a wonderful man of God for 15 years in New Zealand. He's going to be with the Lord now. And uh, the church grew to be the largest church in New Zealand for a while. Now there's some mega churches there, but uh, we were running about 1,000 to 1,200 people. We had a big old theater building in the middle of Christchurch. It's been torn down now because of the earthquake years ago. And uh, Peter was a senior pastor. We had a plurality situation, but he was a senior chief amongst equals. And uh, he never came into the office. He didn't have an office in the church. He had a uh, a closet in his bedroom that he uh, he fasted in and prayed in, you know, hours a day. He was a godly, godly man. But every once in a while, the phone would ring. And... Uh, the secretary would say, Peter's on the line. I'd pick up the phone and Peter would say, David, I'm coming into town this afternoon, which literally was less than two miles away. And he'd say, do you have time for a milkshake, uh, which was cold for coffee, tea, get together. And uh, he'd knock on my office door. We'd walk down four flights of uh, stairs, uh, find a little coffee shop somewhere. And then he'd ask me different questions about my life. How are things going? How's your marriage going? How are you and Nancy going? He had a pr real prophetic edge to him. And sometimes he'd point that finger at me and say, come on, tell me the truth. You know, and you'd end up sort of spilling the beans uh, because you knew he was uh, he was sincere. He wasn't just poking around. But somewhere in that conversation happened many times. He would always ask me about my devotional life. And he would say to me, David, remember, I don't ever want you coming into the church office until you spend a minimum of an hour on your face before God. And as a young man, you know, I established a, uh, a discipline thanks to uh, Brother Peter, whereas every single day I'd go out, we had a big house and there was a garage that was not a, it was attached to the house, but you couldn't, there was no uh, exit from the house in the garage, I had to go outside. There was a large enough garage so they had a little room in the back that was full of paint cans. It was about maybe four feet, five feet wide and about nine feet long. I put a door on the end of that thing, cleaned out all the paint and so on, put a carpet down, and I'd go out there every single morning, get on my face before God and pray before going into the office. Mm. And, uh, he understood that ministry flows out of relationship. Mm. You know, just the same way, you know, life comes out of, uh, out of relationship and the natural, it comes out the same thing in the spiritual, you know, so... You know, I say to uh, young men and, and women going into the ministry, listen, maintain that devotional life with God. You know, dig your own well, have your own source, 
when discouragement comes and so on, you know, you 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 built a relationship with God that you know He's not going to fail you and so on, you know. So I, I think that would be the, the 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 biggest key. I think the other is just to remain in humility. You know, the, the first chapter of my book on surviving the anointing deals with dependency, absolute dependency on God. You know, and using Jesus as our example. He said, I, I only do the things that please the Father, or whatever the Father tells me to do. You know, it's absolutely dependent. And so if that was true of the Son of God, how much more you and I, we need that dependency on God, you know. But to remain in that place of humility, I, I carry in my notes here a, a page that I took out of a book uh, on uh, the nature of revival by John Wesley. And he quotes uh, George uh, Whitfield, the famous uh, revivalist. And Whitfield says, I preached my sermon on early piety, and at the request of the societies, they printed it. For the next three successive months, there was no end of people flocking to hear the Word of God. So in those days, they'd uh, put the sermons, obviously no podcasts, but they'd put the sermons in a print form. And uh, and so all of a sudden, he, uh, he surged in popularity. He goes on to say, thousands went away from the largest churches for lack of room. They gave their full attention, listening like people concerned for eternity. Mm-hmm. And I now preach nine times a week. The early communions were awesome. On a Sunday morning, long before day, you might see the streets filled with people going to church. With lanterns in their hand, they conversed about the things of God. And then he says this, and this is the clincher. The tide of popularity began to run very high. I could no longer walk on foot as usual, but had to go in a coach from place to place to avoid the hosannas of the multitude. They grew quite extra, uh, extravagant in their applause. Had it not been for my compassionate Jesus, popularity would have destroyed me. I used to plead with him to take me by the hand and lead me unhurt through this fiery furnace. He heard my request and allowed me to see the vanity of all applause except his own. <laughs> I mean, he calls popularity a fiery furnace and he pleads with God. You know, to, today we'd be saying, Thank you, Lord, you've blessed me. You know, and I'm, I'm on TV, I'm on so many stations and so on. You know, he saw it as a real, you know, it, popularity is going to destroy me. You know, wow. a so man I, tested by the praise he receives, huh? Yeah. You know, so, you know, re, uh, remaining in a place of humility, you know. And not unto us, not unto us, but to your name be glory. You know, just uh, acknowledging, but for the grace of God, there go I, you know. So, um, yeah. And to me, the anointing is, um, you know, I liken the anointing to very crude illustration, but winning the lottery. You know, imagine that you're living a life of poverty, eating eating out of dumpsters, uh, you know, sleeping under bridges and et cetera, hardly, you know, not, not a penny to rub together. All of a sudden, you're notified by some uh, lawyer that a rich uh, relative has died and you've got $10 million in the bank. And suddenly now you have the ability to do things you could never do before. You can now, you know, dine at the finest restaurants, go to the uh, finest hotels, drive the most expensive car, take cruises. I mean, you've got the resources. That's the anointing. You're an ordinary average person. The Spirit of God comes on you and suddenly you find yourself with the abilities you never had before. Prophetic gifting, teaching gifting, whatever, you know. Again, I carry in my, my notes, uh, this, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, it says, good lottery luck goes bad fast. <laughs> and, uh, there's a whole four or five cases of people that won mega millions and within a matter of years were back in poverty because they didn't know how to steward it. Wow. And I think, you know, I think the anointing is like that. You know, can I can I steward what God's given me? Can I, can I remain you know, humble and dependent and so on. Uh, and uh, most of the time, you know, well, I shouldn't say most of the time, but a lot of people can't. You know, it goes to their head. They think that, uh, you know, the gift is theirs almost. It's not a it's not a gift. It's something that they've, you know, um, something that they've earned, so to speak. And uh, as a result, pride comes in and one thing after another, you know. So I think there's a number of things, you know, as far as uh, surviving that are important. But uh you know, dependency and humility, I would say, are some of the uh, the top ones. You know, the disciples came back one day after Jesus gave them authority to cast out demons and said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, listen, don't get 
don't get braggadocious, so to speak. Don't brag about that. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Wow. In other words, I think he was referring, if you keep on like that, it was pride that brought the devil to uh, the Lucifer to become the devil. You know, that's my interpretation, that verse. And, and, uh, uh, and so just rejoice in the fact that your name is written in the book of life. You know, that's what he said to them. And I think many times, you know, we can, boy, you know, 10,000 people go to my meetings or, you know, the altar was full tonight and we can allow that to sort of, you know, become a, uh, become a, what, uh, a strategy of the enemy to destroy us and we don't realize it, you know. So, uh, yeah. There's a portion of your book here, uh, oh. very, very similar to what you're saying now. It says, uh, there's a deception that comes with any emphasis on service. The lie is that service to God can be measured both by numbers and results. We subtly become like the Pharisees who prided himself on being spiritual because he fasted and paid tithes. His works, in his own mind, were evidence of his spirituality. The intensity of first love, however, cannot be measured by numbers or programs, nor can it be valued by budgets or buildings. We deceive ourselves if we look at, at a marriage as being great based solely on the size of the house, the spouse's income, or the size of the family. None of these visible assets reveal the love the couple shares together. Would you say that's in line with what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's an old quote yeah, you said. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, there's an old quote you said, uh, never let the means of worship eclipse the yeah. object of worship. Can you explain that? Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a devotional actually. Uh, and I can't remember the guy's name. I have it in my Bible. There's somewhere where he, it was when they uh, brought the ark into the battle. Uh, the, you know, when the Philistines, and that's when the Philistines captured it, but they thought, you know, we'll use this as a means of gaining the victory. And so it was, uh, you know, in other words, if we've got God on our side, so to speak, and they were using God in order to, uh, you know, win the battle rather than just worshiping God for who he was. That's possibly not the best description, but uh, if I could find it, I could read it to you here. But, uh, you know, we can use it's the, the object of worship. It was the ark that they were misusing for their own ends rather than than uh, uh, for uh, worshiping God himself, you know, so. Um, yeah. There's another one that comes to mind. I heard you say, um, nothing is more likely to lead to error or heresy than to focus on part rather than the whole. Can you explain yeah. that one? That was um, G. Campbell, uh, Either G. Campbell Morgan or um, it was the other one. Anyway, it was a it was a quote that uh, in uh, in one of the books that I read. I think it was G. Campbell Morgan. He said, "There's nothing so likely to lead to error or heresy as to focus on the parts rather than the whole." And uh, you know, I'd explain it this way: that um, America has been good at focusing on parts. We have entire movements built around parts. We have the faith movement built around faith. We have the signs and wonders movement built around signs and wonders. We have the holiness movement, if you like, that goes back, you know, built around holy living and so on. And all those things are, are, are good in their, uh, in the, in their uh, place. But um, it's when we put all those parts together, if you like, you have a person. And, uh, and so we can, you know, we can get into danger. Uh, I've got my notes here too. In, in Ephesians 4, verse 15, it says, we are to grow up in all aspects like unto him. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that one day, and in my mind, uh, I felt the Lord say, there's three ways that you can break down the life of Christ. His person, his purpose, his power. Mm -hmm. His person, uh, and you've got you've got uh, churches built around the person, meaning his holiness, the, uh, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit being Christ-like, loving, kind, gentle. And obviously, there's a zillion scriptures. Uh, we are to be all of those things. But then there's other people who come along, they study the life of Christ and they, they focus on his purpose. Son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost, you know, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And so then you've got the evangelistic emphasis where everybody's out, you know, winning souls. Again, nothing wrong with that because we've got a, a bunch of verses. And then you've got the power of Jesus where it says he went about uh, anointed by the Spirit of God and, uh, and uh, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and so on. And so you've got branches of the church, if you like, that focus on those different aspects, evangelism, 
holiness, signs and wonders, and so on. But the Bible says we're to grow up, uh, grow up in all aspects. There's got to be that balance. And um, I, I think we can so easily get off and focus again on the parts rather than the whole. So, I think that's beautiful. So I'm 42. I've been okay. in ministry full full time for just about 13 years now. Okay. As you know, I went to Browns Revival School of Ministry. Okay. Um, if, if you were just to kind of look at those that are in my my sphere of life, and you just to look at, at us in the face and say something to us, what, what would what would you say to us? No God. <laughs> Spend time, you know, in the word, getting to really know God. This is the textbook. This is the pattern. This is uh, is the word of God. And, and so I think, you know, if you get to, you know, if you can just soak yourself in the word of God as much as possible, you know, then, uh, you know, we've got everything that we need. I mean, the Bible says it's everything that pertains to life and godliness is here in the word of God, you know, so, but uh, it takes time, you know. Um, I remember Winky Pratney, do you know that name? Yes. Uh, Winky Pratney, one day uh, we were talking back in the days when I was involved with the Youth on Mission. So it's about 40 years ago, at least. And uh, he, he uh, read a scripture about Jesus coming down from the mountain. I think it's Mark 4. And uh, he said he appointed 12. Uh, and it says that they might be with him. And he sent them out to preach the gospel, cast out demons, and so on and so forth. And I remember Winky looked at me, David. Uh, he said, David, you realize that before we go out and cast out demons, preach the gospel, and so on, the first thing Jesus did with his disciples he appointed 12 that they might be with him. And he said, uh, he looked me in the eye and he says, we have no right to preach the gospel unless we've spent time with him. Wow. And John, of course, begins his epistle, that which we've seen, that which we've heard, mm -hmm. that which our hands have handled. In, the, in other words, you know, I, I, I say to people, you know, trying to illustrate that, that uh, imagine we don't have too many uh, salespeople these days, but, you know, you go back 30 years ago, and uh, people would knock on your door on a Saturday morning selling some sort of thing. And so I say, imagine somebody uh, is knocking at your door. You open the door. There's a smartly dressed person. They're holding some sort of an object in the same world from such and such a company. We've got the world's largest door-to-door uh, -door sales in the, in the world. This is one of the greatest uh, objects or, or uh, yeah, items that we've ever had to, uh, to, to sell. It was created in Japan. It swept through the Orient. It's a... Uh, Europe is so like hotcakes, and we are the, the only people in America that have it. You know, every household needs this thing. And he goes on and on and on, very eloquent, very excited, and so on. Finally, you get a word in edgewise. You say, well, what does it do? And he pauses and looks, or she pauses and looks and says, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what sort of a salesman would that be? And I said, you know, the product, if I can put it that way crudely, that we are selling is Jesus. And how can we sell something we don't know? You know, the only way you know anybody is spending time together. And so the more time you spend uh, listening to his word, you know, the more uh, effective you're going to communicate uh, what the product is, so to speak, you know, so. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. You, you preached a message one time on Mary coming behind Jesus. Right, yeah. Um, can, you, can you maybe talk a little bit about that? I remember it was so powerful your observation of her coming from behind him. Yeah. Well, it's a story of uh, the um, most people say she was a prostitute, came into uh, Simon the leper's house, and uh, it says that she came behind him and uh, and then with tears and so on, and that, uh, you know, she didn't come to be in the limelight and how we need to, uh, you know, as we approach the Lord, come in the same way. She came in brokenness. She came with tears and so on. She came with a servant attitude. She washed his feet. You know, I mean, I had a whole message uh, based around that. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, I think so often we want to be in the limelight and he's the one that's supposed to be in the limelight. We have to keep him in the limelight. You know, my job is to, like the Holy Spirit, you know, magnify the Lord. I mean, if that's the job of the Holy Spirit, God forbid that I should be anything other than that where it's not about me, it's about him, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, just um, uh just coming in that place again of humility, really, of uh, unworthiness, recognizing it's only by the grace of God that we can do what we are doing and, and so on. You know, there's a movement right now 
you've probably seen this many times before, but there's like a divide between two camps. One, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which is true. And then we are vile sinners. So one camp would say, you, you're not a sinner anymore. You're righteous. And then another camp would say, no, no, we are vile and in the need of God. How would you address this kind of differentiation? Oh, boy. I mean, uh, hopefully I'm not still vile. <laughs> you know, otherwise the blood of Jesus didn't do a very good job. Uh, you know, you, that should call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sin, not in their sin. So if you're still in your sin, then the, the blood hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Uh, the blood is supposed to wash us. Now, do I believe in, the, you know, Christian perfection, you know, sinless perfection? No, but I do believe, you know, as my father used to say in, uh, in the epistle John, it says that uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the father. If we sin, not when we sin. And my dad used to use the illustration when we lived in England. He uh, he traveled to America back in the back in the day in the fifties by ship uh, because it was cheaper than flying, and it would take seven uh, days to go from Southampton in England to uh, New York City. But he said every single trip, and if you've ever been on a cruise, it's true as well that within an hour or two of leaving the port, you assemble on the deck, whatever deck you you know you're supposed to assemble, and bring your life jacket. And then they tell you how to put your life jacket on and then uh, uh, the safety precautions you'll be assigned to this particular lifeboat, you know, make sure that you go to the right deck, the right lifeboat and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they'll say now, you know, if the boat goes down, this is the drill. And my dad said they'd, they'd always say now, if the boat goes down, he said, imagine that after two hours at sea, this is the alarms go off, which they do. And you're, you're told to assemble. And they say, now, listen, when the boat goes down, what? You know, back up. You, you, in other words, you're planning on the boat going down. And so the Bible says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, not when we sin. And, uh, you know, I use the illustration, maybe you know, I got a pencil. You know, we've got that much lead, and that much of an eraser. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's not it's not that much of an eraser and that much lead. Uh, otherwise, you, you know, the, the whole idea would be make as many mistakes as you can because you've got all this all this rubber here to rub it out. No, you, you've got to, you've got to measure, you know, and I think the blood of Jesus is that way. You know, if we sin, we, we can erase it. Thank God for that. Yeah. But it's not when we sin, we don't deliberately go out and sin, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the other side of that is, uh, you know, there are those that teach that um, you never have to repent after you've repented once, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses you. And uh, so even if you sleep with your girlfriend tonight, it's already forgiven before it happens, you know, and that's obviously a, a, a lie from the pit. You know, uh, I wrote an article uh, in my one of my blogs many years ago now, I guess, it was about the, uh, a car manufacturer that uh, with every car that you buy from this car manufacturer, you get a lifetime of free car washes. And the whole idea is they want to, they want to, uh, you know, clean cars going around town bearing their name. And so, you know, you drive out of the uh, the parking lot with this brand new car that doesn't have a trace of the dirt on it. And for three days, it's absolutely immaculate. And then, you know, you're heading home and there's a detour and you've got to go down and you go down this uh, muddy uh, road and it's uh, the car gets splattered with mud and so on. You pull up at the house and you get out and you look at the car and it's covered in dirt. And you think, man, I- I've got to go and, and wash it. And somebody says to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to wash my car. They said, no, it's already clean. <laughs> and I said, no. They said, yeah, it's clean. It was, uh, you know, w- when it was first clean, you never have to wash it again. I said, no. I said, the provision was made for cleansing, but I have to use the provision. Yes, the, you know, paid when I bought that car in the price of that car, there was provision for cleansing. But I've got to go back and avail myself of the provision, you know. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's the way I would see it, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I think the whole grace message, you know, there's the two sides, uh, the extreme grace that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you do and so on and so forth, God will forgive you. You know, that's a violation. It grieves, uh, you know, the Bible, Hebrews talks about grieving the, the spirit of God, the grace of God, you know. Uh, thank God for 
the song Amazing Grace, because grace had taught our heart to fear, mm. you know, and uh, I don't think we realize sometimes that, uh, you know, when we study the nature of God, God gets hurt. He said to in Ezekiel, you know, I'm hurt by your adulterous ways. Wow. It's like a husband uh, finding out his wife's been cheating. You know, he doesn't just cast that off as though there's nothing wrong. It just deeply to think that my wife betrayed me. I mean, she she slept with some, you know, and God has that same feeling. You know, he's, oh. he's not. Uh, and I think if we see that, you know, and a genuine fear of God comes into our life, you know, that would be another thing I would say regarding longevity. Ask God to put the fear of God in your life. You know, as a young man in New Zealand, we lived on an island off the coast of New Zealand for a while, and uh, they had a uh, a Christmas camp, Christmas down there, of course, was in the summer. And uh, there was a gentleman that uh, preached an entire message. I've never heard one before or since on the fear of God. And at the end of that message, I went forward. Lauren Cunningham from Youth of the Mission was there. Joy Dawson was there. This is in the very early days, back in the in the sixties, and. Um, and the guy that ran the place, a guy called Neville uh, Winger. And after this man got through speaking, I gathered those leaders together. And we went into what used to be a whaling hut on this island. It was just a hut about maybe 14 feet long, about seven or eight feet wide at the most. And um, I, I asked if, if I could meet with them. And I said, listen, I, I've grown up in church. My dad's a minister. I know that sin is wrong, but I don't hate it. Mm. I said, tonight, I, you know, when I heard that message, I said, would you pray for me that the fear of God would come into my life? I remember kneeling down, Lauren Cunningham, Joy Dawson, laying hands on me and praying that the fear of God. And over the years, I've renewed that prayer a number of times. You know, God, give me a hatred of sin. I know that sin is wrong, but, you know, when you've got a hatred of something, you stay away from it, mm -hmm. you know. If you've got a hatred of electricity, don't ask, you know, don't ask me to wire your house type thing. You know, if you've got a hatred of heights, you're not going to let me see me shimmering up a 30-foot ladder. You know, whatever you have a fear of is an automatic deterrent. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a fear in the dark, then you're going to keep the light on all the time. So, you know, so if you've got a fear of God, and it's not that cringing fear, it's that reverential love, yeah. you would never think of breaking the heart of God, you know. And um, so I think, you know, the fear of God seems to be missing today in, uh, in our preaching and, uh, and in the church generally, you know, in our relationship with God. No. Yes, we we have about four minutes left. I'd like for two things to be done. Yeah. Um, I would like you to end by praying that for us. Okay. That we would hate sin. That the fear of the Lord would come into our our lives. Those that are watching, myself included, I really want you to pray for me in this. But also, can you maybe just say a couple of remarks about your father? Um, you know what? If you were to encapsulate him, what would you what would you tell us about him? He was a man of uh, prayer, um, prayed hours a day. You know, I remember when he was just, I think it was the year he died. He died when he was 87. I was um, ministering. I had a church up in a little place called Gig Harbor, Washington, up near Tacoma. And I flew home. And uh, I remember being in the, the guest room that my mother would have. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, hearing the door open in my dad's bedroom, and he would make his way down into his office. And then about two hours later, he would come back. And he did that. I mean, here he was, 87 years of age. And he did that, you know, virtually every day of his life uh, in his latter years. And then during the day, of course, uh, he'd have a lot of people coming and going. But he'd spend, uh, you know, two hours at least. I'd say, you know, a minimum of four or five hours a day in prayer. And, um, you know, he just had that passion for, for God. Passion for revival. He was one of the few men. I, I think if there was a, if there was one thing about my dad's preaching, it was conviction. Mm -hmm. People would literally, almost like Charles Finney, you know, on the squirm, you know, on the, on the sin. You don't see that very much. You've almost got to convince people they're sinners and they need to get saved. Uh, people would actually come forward before my dad would finish preaching and kneel at the altar or prostrate themselves around the altar, you know, uh, before he even gave an altar call. And uh, so, you know, he was he, he was everything. I, I, I could never put a fault on my dad in that sense. He wasn't one thing in the pulpit, another thing in the pew, uh, so to speak. You know, now he was dad. You know, he took his places. And of course, he had a major accident when I was a kid. And that uh, slowed him down a lot. But um, 
you know, he he was uh, he was good dad, dad, had a good sense of humor and, and so on. But his real passion was God and revival. You know, wanted to, wanted to see the church see revival. You know, he said in uh, uh, in evangelism, the evangelist gives the altar call. In revival, uh, God gives the altar call. <laughs> You know, the day of Pentecost, what must we do to be saved? Peter didn't say, now listen, bow your heads. And, you know, they were crying out. That was a real revival, you know, conviction and so on. You know, so, yeah. But uh, if our time's gone, I'll pray. Please pray for us. Father, I pray right now, Lord, for my brother, for all those that are listening to this podcast, that, Lord, we would know once again the fear of God in our life. The Lord, it is, it is only you can, Lord, that you would place a holy reverence for who you are, the Almighty. Your word says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And so, Father, we ask you that, Lord, you would give us that first love, and with that first love, that fear of ever offending you, mm. ever betraying you, ever turning our back on you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, right now. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We ask for that in Jesus' name. You said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And so we ask for wisdom. We ask for the fear of God, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, bless you. Sorry to seem to go so quickly. <laughs>